Tonight's program is devoted to the second part of an hour-long conversation with Richard Heiser, senior editor of Audio Magazine and author of the most detailed and comprehensive speaker reviews yet to appear in an American publication. The program is on tape, and I will probably be asleep in a tent somewhere as you hear this. Mr. Heiser's chief concern in audio is trying to establish more relevant and precise measurements to pin down the subtle kinds of distortion in systems. Stereo image smearing, for example. His investigations over the past 20 years have convinced him that what happens to the phase or relative arrival time of the various components of a sound has a profound effect on what we hear. And the fact that there are different types or mechanisms of nonlinear distortion may account for the fact that some types of distortion are more audible in small amounts than other types are in large amounts. Magnetic tape distortion has a very high percentage of harmonic distortion. Ah, that's something I'd like to get into. And many amplifiers have a one-hundredth or perhaps one-thousandth the measured harmonic distortion of tape, and yet you'll hear that amplifier mm -hmm. through the tape. Well, what are you hearing? That's what I'd like to know. Okay, let me say that you are perhaps hearing a deformation that you cannot, deformation of the sound illusion, that you cannot accept as being something natural. Now, let me say something that's probably controversial, and uh, all the final voting is not in, but if you can imitate nature as a distortion in such a way that it is the way in which we hear sound, it will tend to be absorbed by us as a rightness of perception. Uh, our own hearing mechanism is logarithmic, very nonlinear. If we had an amplifier whose harmonic distortion was as bad as the human ears must be, if it's nonlinear and harmonic and, and logarithmic, uh, it would we would think sound terrible. But in fact, that is our hi-fi reproducer. Mm -hmm. That is our microphone. Well, it's quite literally what we grew up with. That's right. right. I mean, we have now suppose our... right now suppose I create a type of distortion that mimics that, maybe increases that just a little bit in the same way. The effect might be that the sound sounds louder, but it doesn't really sound terribly distorted, even if the percentage of distortion by conventional measurement is very high. Got to digest that for a minute. Um, are you saying that if you design a component in a reproducing system in such a way that it contains only a nonlinearity of the type that exists in the ear mechanism, that that nonlinearity will not be audible as what most people think of as distortion. That is a, a, a messiness and a that fuzziness That seems to, the to be the general case. As I say, the, the jury isn't in, but, but if you look at louder. those types of Why instruments... Oh, it could. And, and okay, you're saying, I, in other words, it simply produces an amplitude oh, yeah, it, change. It's a, it's it, might, a, it might mask itself as an amplitude yes, change, rather, yes. and, and that only, intensity change only. Yeah. Yes, okay. uh, a ventriloquist is extremely adept at changing the sound cues in a way to give you a changed illusion. Mm -hmm. Now, he depends upon your, your visual interpretation as well, so now I've brought a whole new series of dimensions in. You have a lot of other things that go in listening and understanding sound. It's the visual as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that a ventriloquist will try to draw your attention away from something, but he will alter the cues, he'll modify the spectrum, he may create a type of muffled distortion that makes you think that a voice is in a box and so on, and you're willing to accept that, because that's what you expect to have for that. Mm -hmm. Now, that's a rather far-out thing, but the example that I'm making is that if you distort a sound in a way that can be interpreted by the listener as something natural and not inconsistent with what he's hearing, he may not interpret that as distortion uh, for that particular performance. Or he may interpret it in a way that's different than you would be tempted to say he might. Mm -hmm. uh, harmonic distortion in the tape recording follows almost a log law. Uh, harmonic distortion in some of the early Class B transistor amplifiers did not. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would stand out. Now, there are other reasons why they would stand out, particularly in stereo. Um, 
in the case of, of the transistor sound, this was one that I was very interested yes. in. Yes. <laughs> uh, and let me, let me say when I say transistor sound, let me refer to this particular case, meaning the old Class B crossover notch mm -hmm. type distortion. Can I just break for one moment right. to give a little historical perspective? Uh, some of you, especially uh, younger listeners, may not recall that... Uh, when uh, transistors first appeared on the scene, or, well, transistorized audio amplifiers first appeared on the scene commercially, let's say in the late 50s, and early 60s, there was a big hoo-ha about the fact, and it did seem to be a fact, that they sounded different from most of the tube amplifiers. And some people thought that was an enormous improvement, and other people thought it was a tremendous degradation. Uh, but there was no doubt, at least among reasonably acute listeners that there was a characteristic difference in sound and it came to be known as transistor sound and uh, various explanations were advanced for for why there was a difference and some of them had to do with bandwidth and uh, uh, amounts of feedback that were used and stability and crossover distortion and transient response but it never seemed completely clear why they sounded different and of course eventually uh, transistor amplifiers took over so completely by the time of the middle 1960s or so that uh, uh, it, the, the controversy kind of dropped out of the public eye, and yet there's still a certain amount of discussion. There are, as, as uh, you really dedicated audiophiles are surely aware, in the last few years there's been a blossoming of extremely expensive tube amplifiers, uh, which are just as inefficient and uh, power-consuming and heat-producing as any tube amplifiers ever were before, and yet there are a lot of people who swear by them. There are some old Marantz... Uh, tube amplifiers from the 1950s that are commanding enormous prices now, much higher than they sold for originally. There are some studio engineers who insist uh, on redesigning their consoles to use vacuum tubes of one kind or another, at least in the input stages, uh, because they feel that tubes have a distinctly different kind of sound from transistors. And so that's what that reference to transistor sound is, is all about. Okay, well, let, let, all right, right. let me say that what I'm referring to in this particular case uh, is one special aspect of it which uh, was traceable to crossover notch. And this is one that's relatively easy to visualize. It, it's best aided if you have a blackboard and can sketch waveforms. But let's say that one has an amplifier that uh, has a crossover transition such that very low signal levels have a different gain than the peaks, that is, that the zero crossing, the gain is down and, and you, you get a peakiness in, in the waveform. Now, if you have, uh, let's say, two channels, a left and a right channel, and the sound illusion is that of an object to the left of center, let's say, and let's say that we take a single instrument that's playing at a very low sound level and we, we have it play louder and louder and louder and louder, and, but stay at the same position in space. Now, the left channel loudspeaker carries more signal level than the right channel loudspeaker in a two channel stereo configuration for that. At extremely low sound levels, uh, the right channel may be virtually nipped off because you're in the crossover region. Mm -hmm. The left channel, you now have bits of the peaks coming through. So, what you have are high distortion fragments on the left channel only, nothing coming out of the right channel. This is an extreme case, uh, reducto ad absurdum. Mm -hmm. As you get louder, now the right channel begins to get the peaky distortion that the left channel had had previously. The left channel has more of the fundamental come up. The harmonic distortion ratio is dropping. So what you find if you trace that trajectory, let me call it that, of the position in space of the fundamental and the partials, as the sound gets louder, the first you have nothing but harmonic distortion in the left channel only. As it gets louder, you, you find the distortion fragments begin to smear towards stage center. The fundamental begins to rise from extreme stage left to the proper stage position. So you have a situation where at moderate sound levels, you may have a fundamental coming from about the right position in space, but the distortion fragments will be smeared laterally more over towards stage hmm. center. That is a totally unnatural that's, that's sound. amazing. <laughs> Now, take the same amplifier and put the object stage center. Now what you have is distortion fragments that stay in the same position in space as it gets louder, and the fundamental and the distortion fragments stay there. So that one would be tempted to say that the type of sound that would give you would be a lateral smearing for stage left and stage right stereo illusion. And that's pretty much what happens. And the 
ability of a human to absorb that into something that was what I call a rightness of perception can be strained to the limit if it's pretty bad. You may not be able to put your, your finger on it. Uh, very few people would say, oh my goodness, the harmonics are smeared towards stage center. Mm -hmm. But they know it isn't right. Mm -hmm. It's brittle. Mm -hmm. It has all these nasty properties that, that people didn't like. Now, some people liked it, but that's all right. Uh, but that's a particular uh, case where you can illustrate that there was a genuine coupling between position in space of the illusion, its harmonics and, and uh, fundamental and harmonic fragments, and intensity due to that one aberration crossover. Now, there are many, many other things that come into the so-called transistor sound, and there's a tube sound, as you know, and there's tape sound and so on. But uh, if you trace it down, you can pretty well begin describing it in terms of its distortion of the subjective illusion. Mm -hmm. And okay. what I've been trying to do is to bring into the aspect of loudspeaker testing and, and working through the professional uh, organizations into the professional end of things, the attempt to define the subjective words that people are using in terms of where, when, tone, intensity, and anything else that seems to be necessary. So if a person says bright in a sound, that it is defined so that another person will also say bright if it's given the same mm -hmm. subjective impression. Well, and wine that tasters and cheese tasters and coffee tasters have been using uh, green on terminology yes. for years. <laughs> Of course, what is the nose of a loudspeaker, if you will, if you're a wine <laughs> It's a little thing that sticks out from <laughs> yes. the tweeter. <laughs> but quite seriously, the, uh, so far, it seems to be working out from the standpoint that if you take the, the more exotic definitions that people will use and you sit down with them and force them to define it in terms of what's really happening to that sound, and if you can define it in terms of where and when and tone and so on, these are properties which can then be traced back to the things you should measure in the voltage or in the position of a stylus or in sound pressure of the loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. The link between what you hear and what you measure. Now, this is one possible link. But the fact that there is a possible link is exciting. If you can take a device such as a loudspeaker, take a series of measurements on that device, never having heard the loudspeaker, and then make statements such as, the strings will smear laterally. Mm -hmm. I have done this, presented papers on this. Or if you take a device in which the subjective illusion is, it lacks punch, it doesn't distort the sound, but it doesn't have the dynamic range that I think it should have. And go looking for a change of transfer function gain, acoustic transfer function gain, as a function of frequency, and find it. Mm -hmm. And find that it is worse for that speaker than other speakers that had the appropriate mm -hmm. sound. Mm -hmm. That, to me, is exciting. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that I've found a solution, but by golly, it seems to be working. Mm -hmm. Let me just backtrack for a moment to um, the acoustic transfer function gain change that we're talking about. It's a rather technical mouthful. Um, can you explain that maybe in lay terms, how that might affect what a person hears? What What is it, first of all, and how might it affect what a person well, hears? What I'm, what I'm talking about when I say transfer function gain, I, I mean the following. If I have a signal level into a device, let's say it's a loudspeaker, and I increase that signal level by 1 dB, I should get 1 dB increase in sound pressure level, regardless of the frequency performance of that device, let's say. At any given frequency, if, mm -hmm. I, in, if I increment it 1 decibel in signal input, mm -hmm. I should get 1 decibel in output. Or I suppose at any level also, at any level. to be able to do that. Right, mm -hmm. so that the departure from that one-for-one -one relationship is what I'm calling, in this case, the transfer function nonlinearity. Mm -hmm. And uh, the effect is the equivalent of, of taking the volume control of your receiver and wiggling it in accordance with how loud the signal through that amplifier is. Mm -hmm. uh, in parlance of the thermodynamicist, it's like having a Maxwell demon, that mythical 
creature that mm -hmm. uh, can get it's in there and, and wiggle, let's say, the, the gain of your channel in accordance with not only what the amplitude of the signal is, but its phase and what its tone is. Uh -huh. And very quickly you can see that the effect would be, for example, might be a pan potting of the position. Uh, if the sound in the left channel is a little louder than in the right channel, it means you have a stage left stereo illusion. Mm -hmm. And if, as the sound gets louder, the Maxwell demon on the left channel is changing the gain slightly different than the one on the right channel, that's mm -hmm. called a pan pot. Mm -hmm. And the effect of a pan pot is a lateral smearing mm -hmm. of the sound illusion. Right. Let me uh, intervene to explain pan pot. Okay. <laughs> uh, is a studio engineer's term for a, a, a control on a, on a control console that can essentially route relatively more signal to the left or to the right in accordance with where you set the knob. It's, it's uh, the, the, abbre the, the, the uh, abbreviation, the expression comes from panoramic potentiometer. And uh, it's a very handy way to be able to artificially direct uh, the sound that a particular microphone is picking up either to the left side of the stereo image or the right side or anywhere in between you like. It's a very useful control. And you can imagine that if you, if you had a pan pot that was being operated not by a human, but by some Maxwell's demon or some electronic circuit or whatever, in such a way, in, in, in such a way that it varied in accordance with the signal, you would have a very confused stereo image. Right. <laughs> it would be a little bit like, let's say, varying the... Uh, what was it? I thought of doing this, actually, at a, at a party sometime, and having the brightness of the lighting vary in proportion to the loudness of the average sound of the chatter in the room or that kind of thing. Oh I mean, it's complete, just completely <laughs> hooking one, vari one, one variable, in, in what ought to be an independent variable, mm -hmm. to another independent mm -hmm. variable, hooking them together so they're no longer <laughs> independent. And you can imagine yeah. what that kind of thing would do to the sound. Well, the subjective illusion you might have in a case of that nature would be the visual image I have is a painting. You imagine you have a canvas stretched between the two loudspeakers, you've painted your orchestra on the canvas, and now while the paint is still wet, you smear it with your hand. Mm -hmm. Certain instruments will be spatially smeared more than others. And interestingly enough, if you begin making such measurements on loudspeakers, you find, by golly, they do have that distortion. Now, that will not show necessarily as harmonic or cross-modulation or the normal frequency response. It's a brand new ball game. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can then begin looking at the relationship in spectral balance of the mid-range, the tweeter, and the woofer, which have different properties of this, and say, gee whiz, if the fundamental is carried by the woofer, as it is in many cases, and the higher order partials by the mid-range or tweeter, the amount by which they are laterally and in-depth smeared will be a function of many more important variables. They will be smeared differently because they're carried by different drivers. Uh, we're talking now distortion. We're not talking mm -hmm. a neat linear device, but a distorting device, which, of course, all loudspeakers really are to one extent or another. And you can actually begin relating this to such things as saying, look, if I play a single violin, there's a good chance that the spatial accuracy will be reasonably good. However, if I have a string section, I would suspect because of the modulation of transfer gain with this broad range, which is modulating other frequencies, that the string section will be more laterally smeared than a single violin. Or that a human vocal, single vocal, might appear well-defined in space, but a choral group will cascade over themselves like a waterfall, for example. I can't offhand intuitively see why that would be. Well, if you can uh, recognize that, that a one, one loudspeaker might handle all of the frequencies up to, let's say, one kilohertz, and any single uh, tone or, or tone with a limited number of partials has a gain modification that obeys a certain rule, and now you add a number of other tones which are not necessarily related to it, and they are also changing the gain of the whole darn thing. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had a single... Let's say you had uh, Concert A, 440, and the loudspeaker handled Concert A beautifully. But uh, any time middle C or 262 hertz is along, not only is middle C affected, but Concert A is affected. So A by itself might be reproduced rather accurately. But when you have A and C, C is distorted and A is also distorted. Mm -hmm. Now, the effect of C's distortion may be acceptable as a change in timbre. Mm -hmm. 
effect of distortion of C on A is a total unmusical thing. For example. Okay, yeah. And if you chase through the very complicated structures you can run into in certain loudspeakers, you find, yes, there you can have situations where a broad spectrum of, of music or of noise or what have you will cause such a tremendous uh, cross-modulation of musical fragments which would not themselves be terribly affected. Then you, the prediction would be that you might cause, if, let's say, you have horns in the right channel more than in the left channel, and you have an object that's supposed to be stage center, so it's carried equally well in the left and right channel. When the horns come on, you may find that there's a smearing of that stage center object. Hmm. Because the okay. right channel is modulated okay. in a way different than the left channel. Okay. Now, that gets very complicated, and that's part of the yes and no answer. This would be, earlier. in a way, a little bit analogous to something that I bet most listeners have noticed, uh, probably not quite so much on our air as on a lot of other radio stations. Um, when you have the, the, let's say, the voice of an announcer modulating the background noise of, let's say, applause or ambient sound of one kind or another, like traffic or cheering at a sports event, uh, every time he talks, uh, the uh, crowd sound dips. As soon as he stops talking, it comes back up yes. again. Yes. Uh, there are devices that do that electronically. It's sometimes very handy to have something uh, in, in a great many situations. It's undesirable, and it's certainly undesirable if you're trying to preserve the dynamic range uh, and the overall lifelike balance of, of things. So, in other words, what, what you're doing, I guess, is you're tying what happens to one phenomenon to the fate of another phenomenon. That is correct. Right? Yes. You're linking two things, things that in, 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 in real life, so to speak, or in nature, are not normally linked, or at least not necessarily linked. Right. And because of some deficiency, some defect, some imperfection in an amplifier or speaker, you are now causing these things to interdepend. Right. Right? Okay. What was formerly a nice, now this will get you Euclidean geometry, uh, the, the geometry of the illusion was uh, such that the components were not related, now becomes cross-related to a certain extent. Now, I gave it a name. I called it representation distortion. Hmm. Uh, in 1969, uh, the particular type of representation distortion, which was the easy one to explain, uh, I called time delay distortion. Now, if you have an, an imperfect frequency response, whether it's imperfection of amplitude or phase, the effect is a smearing of time. Mm -hmm. So you may find that the effect of, of an imperfect frequency response will be that the arrival time of certain components will be arrayed in a manner different than it would be for perfect reproduction. We're getting back to phase, you see. That's why I said that was the, the stepping stone. Right. And, and so what you have then is a cross-coupling of tonal properties and arrival time, which really do not exist in nature, caused by the distortion in this device. Now, if you set up a steady state signal for evaluation of, quote, the listenability of phase distortion, unquote, you may not hear that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes the subtleties that arise are those of arrival time. What you should listen to for that are aperiodic disturbances, things which are of short duration, pistol shots, things of that nature. That's really what separates the men from the boys from that standpoint. Does the vocalist come from stage center three feet back and you can literally see the lips moving? Mm -hmm. Or is the vocalist a ten foot wide diva, acoustically mm -hmm. that is? Yeah. Uh, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay, now, I understand some of the mechanisms that can produce that in amplifiers and in speakers. What about phono cartridges? Is it a simple one-for-one -one correlation? Are the same mechanisms present? Or, or what... what do, do all the things that you have talked about so far uh, account for the things that I noticed subjectively about focusing, imaging, depth, and so on. They are ascribable in that. Whether they account for it, there may be other actions going on. Uh -huh. The the general mathematics that goes behind all of this game playing is applicable to anything. You're talking loudspeakers, cartridges, the records, you know, that there's a difference in, in vinyl. 
-hmm. Try playing a, a, a master that's made of metal, one versus vinyl, you get a totally different sound. Mm -hmm. Compliance of the wall sure. and so on. It mm -hmm. all is covered by the same sort of thing because we're talking about uh, form, shape, how one thing reacts with another. We're talking mm -hmm. the geometry. Now, in the case of, of a cartridge, I, I'm out of my depth from that, but I do know that there are uh, very serious interactions in, in the uh, compliance of the wall and the cartridge, the moving mass and so on, which do get into this. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there, there's something that has become evident within the last two years, and that is in the CD4 cartridges particularly, uh, the improvement in quality has been enormous in order just to reproduce these things. And the measurements that have been made now are such that they are now beginning to make phase and amplitude measurements. And lo and behold, there are many cartridges that are non-minimum phase. There are others that are minimum phase. And the effect of that could be a smearing of the sound. Mm -hmm. Now I'm talking from the standpoint of a modulation applied to the stylus as translated into a voltage going into your pickup, into, into your uh, preamplifier. Mm -hmm. Could you give a quickie definition of minimum phase? Oh boy. <laughs> I can give you the geometric meaning of it, right, which may that. or may not be applicable. If you have a system that has a certain, let's say, frequency power spectrum, amount of sound is a function of frequency. Mm -hmm. There are an infinite number of devices that may have exactly that same frequency response because you're only measuring the amplitude. There is only one of that infinite set in which the arrival time of the energy is a minimum, the best clustering of, of sound for that given power spectrum. That one is the one that is minimum phase. What determines best in this case? Best in this case means that the relationship between the amplitude and the phase is a particular one. Mathematically, they are joined by what's called a Hilbert transform. And please, we can't go into that yeah. here. Yeah, okay. But the, if you, what that means is if a device is minimum phase and you correct the amplitude by means of conventionals, resistors, inductors, capacitors, you will then have automatically corrected the phase. And when you do that, a flat frequency response, as far as amplitude, will give you the best score wave response and everything, because uh -huh. the arrival time of all the components is the shortest they would ever be for a given power spectrum. Uh -huh. okay. If, on the other hand, the device were non-minimum phase, and you, loudspeakers and mechanical systems can be, most amplifiers are not, but if the device were non-minimum phase, any attempt to equalize the amplitude would give you a flatter measured amplitude, but you might find your square square wave response was considerably distorted. Because you were now tinkering with the time relationships right. of different frequencies. They were you, not in other words, if you made a phase response plot of, of phase with frequency, it, it would, would no longer be, be uniform. Regular. That is correct. And the, you would have traded regularity of amplitude for, for irregularity in phase. Precisely. Like that. I see. Okay. That's and you would help. find that what the interpretation of that in terms of the of the time would be that you had time smeared the partials and the fundamental in a way that was imperfect. Terrific. Why don't we stop there All right. for this time? Um, <laughs> I've been talking with Richard Heiser, who's a senior editor of Audio Magazine and has been uh, researching both formally and informally, I guess, into audio for some 20 years or so. That was the second and last part of a conversation with Richard Heiser. The first part appeared last week. Next week, we'll try to have Mr. Heiser here in the studio to answer your questions. If this conversation, including last week's, has stimulated any questions or comments, write them down and send them to infidelity, two words, KPFK, Universal City, 91608. Again, the address, infidelity, KPFK, Universal City, 91608. Until next Friday at 9 p.m., good listening. This is Peter Sutheim. <laughs>